Good afternoon everyone, Country Flyboy here, and today, the reveal of the next aircraft in this tutorial series. Actually, this will probably be the first video in that series of tutorials. So, I've done several um, little generic tutorials, uh, just got finished with the ILS tutorial series. So, what aircraft should I do next? And I have decided that the aircraft I shall do next will be... The Cessna 310 by Milviz, one of my favorite little um, twin prop airplanes. So this sits, we're doing a ten pro, t twin prop. Uh, I've decided we're going to do a tutorial not just on the Cessna 310, but proper operation of twin engine airplanes. Now 310 is going to make that interesting. Because if you compare the 310 to the default Baron, the default Baron has counter rotating props, which means the right engine or the left engine will rotate clockwise, and the right engine will rotate counterclockwise. So the centrifugal force of each, the uh, P factor and the torque and all that equals out, so the aircraft flies really stable. Uh, the Cessna 310 does not have that. The Cessna 310, both props, the left and the right, spin clockwise, which means this aircraft has a decent amount of adverse yaw in it. It's it's it takes some getting used to. <clears throat> so for the first video here, we're just going to go over the um, the aircraft itself, gauges, instruments, and a bit of uh, terminology with it. Alright, so first things first, this is how the aircraft spawns. Um, well, actually, if I shut the door, this is how the aircraft spawns. Uh, chocks in place, Things and uh, plugs in place, no pilot. Hitting Shift E will open the door, obviously. Uh, Shift E2, we have a rear cargo door on this airplane. And Shift E3 opens up the left engine pod cargo. Shift E4 opens the right engine pod cargo. And that's it. Um, unfortunately, Milvis did not model, or at least I can't find a way to open it, the, uh, the nose cargo bay. Uh, on the real Cessna 310, there is a nose cargo bay, and you can see the door for it right there. It opens up, and that's a pretty decent-sized cargo bay in there, too. A lot of times, they actually put, some owners will put a radar in there, so you can, this aircraft can have a weather radar in it. I don't, I don't know why they did that. If it was me, I would have modeled the engine pods on Shift 3, both left and right one just opened up on Shift 3 and put the, uh, the nose door on Shift 4, but whatever. They didn't model it that way for some reason. Alright, so let's shut all the doors real quick. <clears throat> Alright, all but the main door are open, or closed now. Let's go over some of the weights and speeds this aircraft has. Uh, we need to be familiar with as we uh, learn to fly it. The first weight we need to be worried about is the standard empty weights. Approximate standard empty weights for the Cessna 310 are... Uh, this is a 310R, I believe, or is it a 310R2? 310R, okay. This is a Cessna 310R. Its empty weight is 3,347 pounds. <clears throat> Alright, and we have a maximum ramp weight on this airplane of 3,535 pounds and a maximum takeoff weight of 5,500 pounds. So if we take 5,500 and subtract the empty weight of 3,347, this aircraft has a useful load of 2,153 pounds. Um, quite different from the 172 that we're used to flying and the 182. So this plane can haul around a decent amount of weight to it. Uh, that's a that's the useful load limited by takeoff weight. Um, for the Cessna 310, Cessna 182, and other airplanes like that, you're probably used to flying. Uh, they have essentially one maximum weight, and that is the the maximum takeoff weight, because their max landing is the same, their max zero fuel is the same, their max ramp is the same. But this aircraft has several different weights, so we're getting into more complex and comprehensive aircraft here. Um, takeoff weight, 5500. Zero, zero. Max landing weight is four, 100 pounds lower. It's 5,400. Max zero fuel weight is 4,900. Alrighty, its speeds. Its maximum sea level speed is 207 knots. Recommended, or the maximum recommended cruise speed 
75 percent power at 7500 feet is 195 knots uh, rate of climb this aircraft can climb with all both engines running at 1662 feet per minute on a good day and on a good day with one engine inoperative that gets cut essentially in an in three quarters it's 370 feet per minute only on one engine so yeah we'll be definitely going over uh, what to do a lot of learning to fly twin engine airplanes in real life and when you get into twin engine rating it's all learning to fly it with one engine because when you fly a twin engine airplane and both engines are running it's essentially the same as flying a single engine plane for the for the most part there's a few things different but for the most part it'll handle exactly like a, uh, a single engine lovely cockpit by Milvis here so this airplane comes with uh, two different cock or three different cockpits. It comes with this cockpit, which is the 3D analog, my personal favorite because it's a good marriage between the old steam gauges and the newer glass cockpit. We got a Garmin GNS 530, GNS 430, and a GTX 330, as well as the Bendex King um, Cap 140 and the ADF. Uh, we also have lovely. Uh, Cessna gauges here, Bendex King HSI, airspeed. All the engine gauges are over there. Like nice little plane here. Uh, it comes with a G1000 cockpit, although the G1000 in it is absolutely terrible. They, t I can't believe this Milviz. This was just for a payware add-on. I expect better than what Milviz delivered with that G1000. They essentially just ported over the default G1000 into this plane. And it's terrible. It even looks wrong. It, it It's just sad how bad it is. Um, then you have the other one, which is the, I'm trying to remember the name of it, the free radio one, which is the same as this one, but you don't have these integrated GPSs. You just have the uh, analog radios. And it's, it's also crap. This is the main one. This is the best one, too. <clears throat> Okay, what other speeds do we have to worry about? Let's go over the different speeds. The maneuvering speed at this aircraft at max takeoff weight, again, 5,500 pounds. At um, sea level, maneuvering speed is 150 knots calibrated. This indi is indicated airspeed. 148 knots indicated is the maneuvering speed. Uh, maximum flap extension speed, the VFE, is... 158 for the first notch and 139 for the second notch. Maximum gear operating speed is 138 knots. These are important speeds that we need to know. <clears throat> so, because we'll be using flaps on this plane, um, they don't have the speeds marked on the airspeed indicator. There's no special indication for those two speeds, the VLE and the VFE for the first notch. Uh, we just sort of have to know them. So, uh, 158 right around there I'm just gonna say 150 is the FE speed I'll give us a nice safety margin and the LO speed the the uh, gear operating speed is 138 we'll just say 130 so there's 150 there's 130 so those are the two speeds we have to worry about them a lot uh, there's also the uh, one engine inoperative best rate of climb speed which is 106 knots. That blue line right there. The two, mo the three most important things on this aircraft's airspeed indicator, aside from the LE and the FE, is top of the white arc, blue line, red line. If you uh, delay lowering the flaps and gear until you're inside top of the white arc, you're not going to overstress them. You might overstress the gear because they are uh, 138 knots just inside the white arc. But the odds of you doing that are very low. Because uh, you'll be slowed down well enough before you need to lower the gear once you're inside the wide arc. And obviously the wide arc is the safe extension speed for maximum flaps. So, yeah, there you go. Uh, blue line is the best rate of climb speed for one engine in operative. That's a very, very important speed. Uh, twin engine airplanes always operate above blue line. Never want to see the airspeed drop below blue line unless you're doing slow flight. So, blue line, very important. We take off just below blue line. We climb out just above blue line. 
Uh, we land just above blue line, so yeah, we never really want to see the speed drop below blue line. Red line, let me look it up here, is the minimum control speed, VMCA, uh, just above 80 knots. 81 knots, according to the uh, manual here, is the v minimum, minimum control speed. That's red line. If you get it below blue line, you absolutely never want to get it below red line. Uh, below blue line, it, with one engine and operative, you're not going to climb. You can only climb at speeds above blue line with one engine out. In red line, you just cannot fly. So takeoff range on this airplane is between red and blue line, usually around about 90 to 100 knots is where I like to rotate with it. It usually gets airborne, though. I rotate about 90 to 100 knots. It'll usually get airborne just above blue line in most cases. All right, so those are the important speeds we need to worry about. Let's go over some of the uh, avionics in this aircraft. Let's open the window real quick. All right, let's start down here on the lower panel. So here we see um, our main operation switches, ones we don't normally have to touch once in flight. We got, uh, starting from the left going to the right, we got the left engine. Here, a jet out there. Left engine fuel pump. I wonder what that switch is. I want to find that out. Couple covered switches here. I'm not sure what they do. We have the left engine fuel pump. It's a three position switch. Uh, battery's off, so none of this is going to work. We have the middle position, which is off. If we right click it, it'll go to the low setting. Left click it, it goes to the high setting. And same for the right engine high, low, off. Next, we have the starter push buttons and the primer switch. This aircraft has an interesting start procedure in that you have to push the starter engage button and then prime the engine as it starts. So you'll see me going start prime, just like that. That will engage the starter, that's the primer. And repeat for the right. Left, left clicking the primer switch will start the left, in, or prime the left engine. Right clicking it primes the right engine. Next we have the alternator switch for the left engine, master battery switch, and the right alternator. Next we have the magnetos. Notice no keys in this plane like you might be used to with the, uh, with the default aircraft. Uh, this aircraft actually has magneto switches. Uh, they work basically the same. Uh, there's two magnetos for each engine, so we got four switches here. Left magneto. Right magneto, left magneto, right magneto. The two, if you divide it into groups, you got two on the left, two on the right. The two on the left are for the left engine, two on the right are for the right engine. So left engine, left magneto, right, left engine, right magneto, right engine, left magneto, right engine, right magneto. Alrighty, this line of switches here. We have, starting from the left, these two circuit breakers that are not mild, don't do anything, don't worry about them. Next, we have the main DI switch. That turns on the de-icing, uh, de I'm guessing on the wings. I don't see any boots on the wings, so maybe they have a heated leading edge as opposed to de-icing boots. The props do have de-icing boots on them, uh, and that's what that switch is. This switch right here controls the prop, de-ice, and anti-ice system. Right there. This switch here doesn't have a function. I guess you could assign something to it. In, in real life, you would probably be able to assign something to it, like radar on or whatever. But in flight sim, that switch there. Oh, you can click it. doesn't do anything. It's not hooked up. Next, we have pitot heat, just like in the Skyhawk, uh, heated pitot tubes. Avionics Master is the next one. Uh, battery on. Avionics on. And you can hear the fans click on, and all the avionics come to life. Next, we have de-icing. I believe this is a de-icing light, actually, which is not modeled, but clicking that one turns on both uh, de-icing systems automatically. Doesn't turn on pitot heat, though. Uh, in real life, that would be a de-icing light. <coughs> so if you would uh, look, can't really see it in the wing here, mostly because Milviz didn't model it. There would be a light somewhere on the engine pod, pylon, something that would flip on when you flip that switch on and it would light up the leading edge of the wing so you could see whether or not there was ice accumulating on it at night. 
Uh, next one, we have the anti-collision light. Turns on the beacon light up on the tail fin there. Next is the strobe lights. The strobe lights are right where you would think they are. They are in there with the nav lights in that little pod. Nav lights also in the pod. Taxi light is on the nose wheel. Landing lights are interesting in this aircraft. The landing light is a three position switch. So we have full down, which is um, retracted. And it's kind of like a 737 in this regard. You know how the 737's uh, fuselage lights can retract and extend? Uh, this one is the same way. So if I flip the battery on, and we flip it to the first position, it just extends the landing lights out of the pods here. In the second position, we'll turn the light on. So, again, on, extended and off, retracted. And these knobs here control the interior lighting on the aircraft. Unfortunately, Milfis did not model um, various lighting intensities. So the lights can, at least not with everything. Um, instrument panel lights are either on or off, just like a default plane. Now here's an interesting one. Two of these, the, um, the flight instruments, do have various intensities. And so do the engine instruments. But you can't turn these on by themselves. In order for these to function, the main instrument panel lights have to be on. Which kind of defeats the purpose if you ask me, but whatever. Okay, we'll get to the main panel itself last. Let's go over down here. Here we have the fuel selectors. Let me uh, left click to put them both in the uh, off position where they should be when the aircraft is parked. So right here is the fuel selector for the left engine, fuel selector for the right, actually I should say right tank and left tank. Here it's cut off. A single right click means the left engine is going to feed off of the left tank. Single click here, right engine feeds off the right tank. There's the right main tank. If I right click it again, the left engine will feed off the left aux tank. So again, left engine feeds off left main, or <coughs> I can set it to the left aux, and same with the right engine. Right main, right aux. Now here is the yellow zone here, is an interesting one. I can set the left engine to feed off of the right fuel tank, and same with the right engine. I can get it to feed off the left tank. So these sort of function as cross-feed valves as well. Next we have rudder trim. This aircraft does have rudder trim. Very, very useful little thing there. We also have aileron trim on this aircraft. So you might be familiar with the Skyhawk having its uh, single axis trim. It only has elevator trim. This aircraft has elevator trim right there. There it is. We also have rudder trim and aileron trim. I'm not afraid to mess with these since we're not going to be flying the plane today anyway. Now here we have the cow flaps. So like on the 172, the uh, the engine can get hot and we need a way to cool it off other than just the ram air like with the 172. We have these cow flaps. We can open them up. That's full open there, I believe. But here's the thing. You can't really see them on this plane. The cow flaps on the Cessna 310 are internal somehow. I don't know what the engineers at Cessna did. But yeah, you can't see them in the exterior view because the cow flaps are internal. Going on up, we have the throttle, just like any other twin engine plane. There's a full close, and there's full open. That controls the uh, the gate on the carburetor. Not that this plane has a carburetor. I think it's fuel injected. It don't have a carb heat switch, so I'm guessing it's fuel injected. And like the 182's complex uh, engine, we have constant speed props on this one. We can get full forward and full aft DEC. I uh, believe, yes, you can actually see the props moving out there. So if I look at the left prop as I move the left condition lever, you can see it moving. So there is full, full RPM. There is lowest RPM. You might be asking, where is feathered? Because this is not the feathered position. So if the engine fails, we need to be able to feather the prop. And what that means is the prop will turn so that the leading edge is facing directly into the wind. That way it produces as little drag as possible. 
and we'll need every bit of lift and as little drag as possible if the engine fails. So to feather these props, um, the way Milviz modeled it is you bring them full aft like this, and then the feather, you right click the aft third of the gauge. So this, this last little hump right here, right click it, and that brings it into the full feathered position as you can see there. Again, if we watch the right engine when I do it with the right engines, yep, full feathered. Right click it again to take it out of full feathered, and we'll just move them right back up to where they belong. Actually, we'll move them full aft so they're out of the way. I can look at some of the gauges here. Now I have the, uh, the fuel mixture. Note the fuel mixture is actually numbered. Uh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I don't, not 100% sure what the numbers are for. I will be referencing them throughout a tutorial, though. I'll say, let's lean it out to set one or position two or three. Not quite sure why those are there. I, they I don't think they're for leaning for particular altitudes because if that was the case, that's leaned out for 9,000 feet. That's also fuel cutoff. Not 100% sure what that is. I might have to look that up. But uh, I know once we're on the ground and the engine, we start full forward, but once the engines are started, we lean them out to setting three, which is about halfway down the uh, line. Alrighty, move them to the back. Let's uh, get in the right seat real quick. And we can hide the yoke by clicking in the where the shaft meets the panel. Next, we have these switches here. Not modeled. Don't do anything. They are the internal cabin temperature control stuff, climate control in this airplane. So on the right side, we have all of our important engine indications. Let's look at these indications right here real quick. So let me flip the master battery on. You may see these little lights here, these little knobs. These are your warning lights. So here's the gear. We got three green, which means we got three down and locked. Red indicates that the gear is unlocked or in transition. We can test each switch by clicking on it, which will, in real life, that would turn it and engage the switch. So we can test to see whether or not the light is working. So here we got uh, failure for the left alternator, right alternator. They're going to light up because one, the switch is not on, two, the engine's not running. Here we have low fuel lights, and we have, um, <coughs> what's that one? I think that's low fuel in the ox tank lights there. Oh, next we have the, um, the amp meter select. So here's our amp meter. You see our amps from the battery. If I right click it, we can see volts from the battery. We can also check power coming from the right alternator or the left alternator. Engines aren't on, so they're not going to get any indication from them. Flaps right here. We have, in real life, this is a various position switch. No matter where we put it, it will adjust the flaps to match. In flight sim, though, you can only lower flaps in increments. You can't really put them anywhere. So the way they modeled it is the first notch, 10, and the last notch, full, which I believe is... 15 or is that 35 that's 35 so we can lower the flaps to 10 degrees or 35 degrees we can't lower it any in position in between which is helpful actually it's a lot more helpful than you would think it would be okay looking at the um gauges here we had the manifold pressure gotta have manifold pressure in this airplane it's constant speed prop so we need a, a gauge separate gauge for the engine so there's manifold pressure right below it is rpm um, you might see there is an R marked on the needle. Uh, if the left engine was up and running, there's actually two needles in there, but since they're not up and running, they're indicating the same right now. Uh, there's a left and a right engine, so there's a left and a right needle, and they're marked with an L and an R, respectively. There's so manifold pressure, RPM. Next, we have two separate ones, left engine and right engine. This indicates the oil. This is the oil indications. We have oil pressure, oil temperature, and something else. <laughs> Not 100% sure what that is. Is that cylinder head temperature? That can't be cylinder head temperature. C Y L. Hold on, I got the. I still got the P O H pulled up. Let's look. That is cylinder head temperature. Why is it marked C Y L then? Weird. Okay, so we have cylinder head temperature there. Incredibly hard to read from the left seat. That's why we'll be using those gauges there, which we'll go over in a minute. So oil pressure, oil temperature, cylinder head temperature. 
This switch right here is the door seal. So we only have a left door on this airplane, or a right door on this airplane. There's no left door, so we have to get in and out via this door. Uh, once this door is closed, it can actually be sealed. There is an inflatable air seal in there, which will seal the door off. And that switch controls it. Flip it on. Not the battery is off right now, so it won't cut on. But that will inflate the door seal by of a pump. You'll hear the pump come on. It'll go, and they'll inflate the door seal, and we wouldn't be able to open the door. Uh, at the end of the flight, we would flip that to off. And you can hear it cutting on there, even though it wasn't inflated. And that will deflate the door seal, and we can open the door. I'm not sure. I think you can still open the door, even with it inflated. But that seal will seal the door off, so there's no air leaking out of it. Okay, I already went over the RPM. Fuel quantity. Uh, let's flip the master battery back on. And we'll go ahead and close the door and activate the seal, just so you can hear the engine. Yes, we still can open the door with the seal in place. Don't know why you'd want to do that. Makes no sense. Right click it, we'll display the fuel in the aux tanks. We have, what is this, in pounds? Yes. Just shy of 200 pounds in the aux tank. Main tanks have 300 pounds. So that's our fuel gauge. We can flip it to so either main tank or aux tank. And we again, we have the low fuel lights for the main tank, low fuel lights for the right tank. Exhaust gas temperature gauge right here, left side, right side. Suction gauge, outside air temperature gauge. Fuel flow gauge right here. Again, left, right needles. We have a standby altitude gauge, altimeter, and a little crappy like clock. The main gauges we need to reference most of the time are these right here. These four, RPM, manifold, oil, oil. Alright, let's look at the left side. We got a clock, piece of crap clock, never use it. I prefer the one on the, um, the ADF here. Is it modeled? Let's find out. <coughs> well, they do have the clock on there, but I can't really do anything with it. Maybe the engines have to be running. All right. So there is a clock on that gauge. Airspeed indicator, we've already gone over some of the speeds, but uh, white arc is the full flap operating speed. Green arc is the uh, safe flight speed. Red arc, minimum control. Uh, blue line is best rate of climb on one engine. <clears throat> and then you got your standard ranges, uh, green arc, yellow, and the never speed at just shy of 230. Um, can't really see it. I believe this blue one is true air. That can't be true airspeed. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe that's miles per hour. And the main indication is in knots. I think that blue line is in miles per hour. Why you would want that in miles per hour, I never know. Attitude indicator. We got the, um, we got the cage mode which will cage the attitude indicator. Altimeter. Um, fun thing about the altimeter, if you enable tool tips, cockpit tool tips in the sim, you can have the altimeter indicate the uh, millibars pressure, or inches of mercury, sorry. But you can also have it indicate millibars if you r hold the mouse over this and you have tool tips enabled. It'll show the millibars. So this can actually function as both millibars and inches of mercury. Vertical speed indicator, HSI, Bendex King HSI, love HSIs, hate CDIs. Ugh, this is the thing. I don't like like the default 172. It's uh, OBS CDIs over on the right. It, I hate those because you gotta you gotta worry about inbound, outbound radials and stuff like that. I love the HSI because all you have to worry about with an HSI is the inbound radial. And we can actually toggle this between the NAV1 or the NAV2 radio. Uh, and you may notice that we can run it off GPS too. And in order to use the GPS, we have to have the GPS CDI set for GPS. And then this has to be in NAV1. So it can function off NAV1 or NAV2 or GPS. But it has to be in the NAV1 in order for GPS to work. 
Turn coordinator, same as any other turn coordinator. Nav 1, Nav 2, DME right here. Another thing I like about this plane is you got the GPS here, but it also gives you a DME gauge. A lot of planes these days, both in real life and in flight sim, like to uh, have just the GPS and use that for DME. I don't like that. I like to have a second DME gauge in there, just because there is a difference between DME and GPS readout. Now, this down here, if I can position the camera to see them better. These are EGT CHT lean gauges. So if I flip the battery on, you can see them come to life. When the engines are up and running, and we'll go over this more once we actually start flying the plane, but this can help you lean the, uh, the aircraft. It'll show the cylinder head temperature, and you can see these are six cylinder engines, six cylinders per engine. It'll show cylinder head and exhaust gas temperature and let you find the other one. It also has a lean assist function. Very, very useful little thing there. And over here we have an RMI. This has got to be one of the best things ever right here is the RMI. Uh, you no notice it has a nav 1, nav 2. That controls the yellow one, the yellow bar. The green, I believe, always shows ADF. Um, but uh, yellow one, you can function to have it point to the nav 1 or the nav 2 VOR. RMI, great little instrument, especially flying um, DME arcs. And last but not least, we have the avionics. So we have a Bendix King um, audio panel here. There's our outer, middle, inner markers. Uh, we got marker mute switch. COM1, let me just flip the darn avionics on. Marker mute, turn that off. So there, marker is enabled. So if we were flying in ILS, we'll hear the marker audio. Transmitting and receiving COM1, transmitting, receiving COM2. Transmitting COM2, receiving COM1, transmitting COM1, receiving COM2. Not too terribly different from the Skyhawk. Next we have the NAV radio audio, NAV1 audio, NAV2 audio, ADF audio, DME audio. Flip all that off. Now in real life, these two knobs here, there's a click spot there. Oh, that's a test light. We can test them. These two knobs would vary the uh, volume of the headsets for pilot. Co-pilot side, pilot side. And we got the um, GNS 530. Shift 2 will bring up a uh, pop-up of them. <coughs> GNS 530, not 100% like the default GPS. Milvez actually modeled, uh, did a decent job of modeling a GNS 530. Uh, I believe you can also swap this out with Reality XP gauges. Alright, so we got COM, switch, nav, switch. That'll turn the GPS on or off. Uh, that's I. VOR ID. Then we had the VOR name, radial, and DME for it. CDI, you can switch between GPS and VLOC. OBS will turn off the automatic sequencing of waypoints, messages, flight plan. Now here's where it gets different. The default GPS will actually have a terrain display. This one doesn't have terrain display. It has a VNAV page, though, but it has a, a poor man's VNAV. It'll show you your target altitude that you enter in here and it'll show you the rate of climb to get to that target altitude and next waypoint position all that stuff you can't it's not a true VNAV it just shows you your current selected altitude and descent rate it's not a hundred percent but whatever procedures we can activate approaches no departures or arrivals again you'd have to have the reality XP gauges to uh, get the approaches and arrivals and departures working uh, direct to function menu enable auto zoom is the only thing you can do on the menu here enter in clear now let's get interesting so the default GPS main nav page on the inner knob you have this and this where you have the we have heading up and north up now you may notice north up gives a smaller screen and we have some extra information show up including the waypoint we're going to desired track, actual track, distance, and ground speed. Versus here, that's spread all over the place. Desired track, distance, ground speed, ETE, actual track up here. Versus here, it's all on that side. Now we have two other options. If we move it enter, we get departure airfield, 
comms. So we can actually just, we don't have to go to the airport information page, scroll the inner knob twice, we get departure airfield comms. And this functions just like the, uh, the information page. We can actually go Unicom, enter, sends it to the COM1 standby. Flip that over. We're now on the local Unicom frequency. And we have one other page we can go to. Click the inner knob. And that's the GPS status page. This is mostly static. Uh, it shows the current time and altitude, but other than that, current time, altitude, and position, but other than that, it doesn't do anything. Real life, this would have a purpose, but it doesn't in flight sim. And of course, you got the facility information pages and the nearest pages, and that's it. So this is uh, mostly like the default GPS. And all that's repeated over here on the 430 uh, with a smaller screen, except the 430 has an extra option. 430 has this navigation page, which just shows the CDI. It also has a track up nav page and a north up nav page, as well as the frequency and status page. Status page actually has a compass on it, which is interesting. So ADF, Mendex King ABF standard, CAP 140 autopilot, GTX 330 transponder. We can ident, VFR, altitude, standby, turn it off, turn it on. We can flip it off. Buttons down here to put in a transponder code 8 and 9 I do not believe are functional. Uh, they are only for the stopwatches. So here you can have it obviously show pressure altitude when it's in altitude, altitude, altitude mode. <coughs> we also have other functions. We have a flight timer, altitude monitor, outside air temperature and altitude, count up timer, count down timer, and back to pressure altitude. You can actually set the count down timer, go to cursor, and let's punch in 0, 0, 3, 0, start. So now it's counting down from 30 minutes. Clear, stop, stop, clear, clear, clear. So that is the avionics, and I believe that concludes our cockpit tour, because there's nothing on the overhead except for the magnetic compass. We all know what that does. So, yep, that completes the cockpit tour of this airplane. Rather long video. Um, next, we'll start actually doing some tutorials in this plane. So this was just the cockpit tour. Country Flyboy here. We'll see you next time.